Into the north window of my chamber glows the pole star with uncanny light. All through the long hellish hours of blackness it shines there, and in the autumn of the year when the winds from the north curse and whine, and the red-leaved trees of the swamp mutter things to one another in the small hours of the morning under the horned waning moon. I sit by the casement and watch that star. Down from the heights reels the glittering Cassiopeia as the hours wear on, while Charles Wayne lumbers up from behind the vapor-soaked swamp trees that sway in the night wind. Just before dawn, Arcturus winks ruddily from above the cemetery on the low hillock, and Coma Berenice's shimmers weirdly afar off the mysterious east. But still the pole star leers down from the same place in the black vault, winking hideously like an insane watching eye which strives to convey some strange message, yet recalls nothing save that it once had a message to convey. Sometimes when it is cloudy, I can sleep. Well do I remember the night of the great aurora, when over the swamp played the shocking coruscations of the demon light. After the beams came clouds, and then I slept. And it was under the horned waning moon that I saw the city for the first time. Still and somnolent did it lie, on a strange plateau in a hollow between strange peaks. Of ghastly marble were its walls and its towers, its columns, domes, and pavements. And the marble streets were marble pillars, the upper parts of which were carven into images of grave-bearded men. The air was warm and stirred not, and overhead scarce ten degrees from the zenith glowed the watching pole star. Long did I gaze on the city, but the day came not, when the red Aldebaran, which blinked low in the sky but never set, had crawled a quarter of a way around the horizon. I saw light and motion in the houses and in the streets. Forms strangely robed, but at once noble and familiar, walked abroad, and under the horned waning moon men talked wisdom in a tongue which I understood, though it was unlike any language I had ever known. And when the red Aldebaran had crawled more than halfway around the horizon, there were again darkness and silence. When I awaked, I was not as I had been. Upon my memory was graven the vision of the city, and within my soul had arisen another and vaguer recollection, of whose nature I was not then certain. Thereafter, on the cloudy nights, when I could sleep, I saw the city often, sometimes under the horned waning moon, and sometimes under the hot yellow rays of the sun which did not set, but which wheeled around the low horizon. And on the clear nights the pole star leered as never before. Gradually I came to wonder what might be my place in the city on the strange plateau between strange peaks. At first, content to view the scene as an all-observant, uncorporeal presence, I now desire to define my relation to it, and to speak my mind amongst the grave men who conversed each day in the public squares. I said to myself, this is no dream, for by what means can I prove the greater reality of the life in the house of stone and brick south of the sinister swamp on the cemetery in the low hillock, where the pole star peers into my north window each night? One night as I listened to the discourse in the large square containing many statues, I felt a change, and perceived that I had at last a bodily form. Nor was I a stranger in the streets of Olathoe, which lies on the plateau of Sarkis betwixt the peaks of Noton and Cataphonic. It was my friend Alos who spoke, and his speech was one that pleased my soul, for it was a speech of a true man and patriot. That night had the news come of Daco's fall, and of the advance of the Inyotos, squat hellish yellow fiends who five years ago had appeared out of the unknown west to ravage the confines of our kingdom, and finally to besiege our towns. Having taken the fortified places at the foot of the mountains, their way now lay open to the plateau, unless every citizen could resist with the strength of ten men, for the squat creatures were mighty in the arts of war, and knew not the scruples of honor which held back our tall gray-eyed men of Lomar from ruthless conquest. Alos, my friend, was commander of all the forces on the plateau, and in him lay the last hope of our country. On this occasion he spoke of the perils to be faced, and exhorted the men of Alathoe, bravest of the Lomarians, to sustain the tradition of their ancestors who when forced to move southward from Zabna before the advance of the great ice sheet, even as our descendants must someday flee from the land of Lomar, 
valiantly and victoriously swept aside the hairy, long-armed cannibal Nofkis that stood in their way. To me, Alos denied a warrior's part, for I was feeble and given to strange faintings when subjected to stress and hardships, but my eyes were the keenest in the city. Despite the hours I gave each day to the study of the narcotic manuscripts and the wisdom of the Zabnarian fathers. So my friend, desiring not to doom me to inaction, rewarded me with a duty which was second to nothing in importance. To the watchtower of Thapman he sent me, there to serve as the eyes of our army. Should the Inyotos attempt to gain the citadel by the Noro Pass behind the peak of Noton, and thereby surprise the garrison, I was to give a signal of the fire which would warn the waiting soldiers and save the town from immediate disaster. Alone I mounted the tower, where every mound of stan- stat bowdy was needed in the passes below. My brain was sore, dazed in, with excitement and fatigue, for I had not slept in many days. Yet was my purpose firm, for I loved my native land of Lomar, and the marble city of Alathui that lies betwixt the peaks of Noton and Cataphonic. But as I stood in the tower's topmost chamber, I beheld the horned waning moon, red and sinister, quivering through the vapors that hovered over the distant valley of Banoff. And through an opening in the roof glittered the paling pole star, fluttering as if alive, and leering like a fiend and tempter. Methought its spirits whispered evil counsel, soothing me to treacherous somnolence with a damnable rhythmic promise, which it repeated over and over. Slumber watcher, till the spheres, six and twenty thousand years, have revolved and I return to the spot where I now burn. Other stars anon shall rise to the axis of the skies, stars that soothe and stars that bless with a sweet forgetfulness. Only when my round is over shall the past disturb thy door. Vainly did I struggle with my drowsiness, seeking to connect the strange words with some lore of the skies which I had learnt from the narcotic manuscripts. My head, heavy and reeling, drooped to my breast, and when next I looked up it was in a dream, with the pole star grinning at me through a window from over the horrible swaying trees of the dream swamp. And I am still dreaming. In my shame and despair, I sometimes scream frantically, begging the dream creatures around me to awaken me ere the Inyoto steal up the pass behind the peak of Noton and take the citadel by surprise. But these creatures are demons, for they laugh at me and tell me I'm not dreaming. They mock me whilst I sleep, and whilst the squat yellow foe may be creeping silently upon us. I have failed in my duty and betrayed the marble city of Alathui. I have proven false to Alos, my friend and commander, but still these shadows of my dream deride me. They say there is no land of Lomar, save in my nocturnal imaginings. That in those realms where the pole star shines high and the red Aldebaran crawls low around the horizon, there has not been naught save ice and snow for thousands of years. And never a man save squatly yellow creatures blighted by the cold, whom they call Eskimo. And as I writhe from my guilty agony, frantic to save the city whose perils every moment grow, and vainly striving to shake off the unnatural dream of a house of stone and brick south of the sinister swamp and a cemetery on a low hillock, the pole star, evil and monstrous, leers down from the black vault making hideously like an insane watching eye which strays to to convey some strange message, yet recalls nothing save that it once had a message to convey.